the month of December, every Sunday we're unwrapping the gifts of Christmas. Last week we talked about the gift of joy. Today we're going to talk about the gift of love. And we're going to see the love that God has shown to us and the love we have for him this morning in many different ways. There's a lot of different ways to express love, correct? Sometimes it's in a gift, sometimes it's in a word, sometimes it's in a, an action. And this morning, I hope you see the love of God and our love to him expressed in many different art forms. So for the next few minutes, just relax, block out the world out there, and just enjoy the season of love.
Once upon a time, there was a young couple. Though they loved each other dearly, they were very poor. This would be their first Christmas together. Still, they were very poor. They each searched to newspapers daily, looking for that perfect gift that would make this first Christmas together so memorable. Still, they were very poor and had nothing to spend. The only thing she felt she had of value was her beautiful long hair. 
But oh, how she had hoped that one day she would have a beautiful silver brush with which to brush her silken hair. The only thing he had of value was an old pocket watch from his great-grandfather. But oh, how he had hoped one day to have a beautiful gold chain on which to hang the antique watch and to be able to wear it with pride. One day while reading the paper, she saw a beautiful gold chain advertised. The price was more than she could afford, for they were very poor. So she had an idea. She would sell her hair in order to have the money to purchase this perfect gift for her loved one. She left the house happy with her decision and looked forward to surprising him. While she was gone, he picked up the paper, and as he read, he saw advertised the most beautiful antique silver brush. It had belonged to European royalty. It was expensive, but it occurred to him that if he sold his great-grandfather's watch, he could purchase this valuable gift for the one he loved. So he left the house looking forward to surprising her. After several hours, she returned home. She finally had the perfect gift for him. She would indeed make this a memorable event and set about preparing the perfect supper to surprise him with the most perfect gift. When he returned home, he heard her in the kitchen. Wanting to make the event memorable, he ran to the old stereo and put on their favorite song. He called to her saying, Honey, they're playing our song. Come and have this dance with me. As she ran from the kitchen, wanting to make this event ever so memorable, they were both surprised. story? That greatest and most perfect gift of all is always sacrificial love.
morning to all. It's good to be here today. This is our second week in our Christmas program. Last week, as Jan mentioned, we talked about joy. Today, we talked about love. If you're our guest today, I want to say welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Inside your bulletin, you're going to find the message outline for our talk together. And I would ask if you wouldn't mind before you leave this morning or this afternoon, stop by the guest table. We'd like to give you something on the way out. You'll notice that inside your bulletin, you have a connection card. This is a way to help us get to know you a little bit better. If you want to write down a prayer request or something that we might be able to help you with, that's the way you can communicate with us. And again, we're thank you for, we do thank you for being with us today. And we hope that this will be an encouraging time to you. We know that during this time of year, many, many people are not always celebrating in every moment. Sometimes people are going through a very tough time, so we recognize that. And if you're here and that's you, we want to share burdens with you. Uh, on that same note, Beverly is in Atlanta with Russell. Her mom took a turn for the worse, so she is there in Atlanta with her mom and she's by her side. So let's keep them in prayer this morning and also other families who are sick. Uh, you can hear I sound like Frogger today, so hopefully I can, you know, deflect that. But this is a time that we should remember others and in that remembering, let's do something about it. Let's pray, let's, let's give, let's help. So before we get into the message today, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump right into week two on unwrapping love. <clears throat> Father, we're reminded in this song of how much you love us. And Lord, even though we think we know, we really don't know. Lord, it's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond what our finite minds can process. But Lord, one day when we see you, we're, we're going to know. And that's going to be a great day. Lord, for now, we know that you loved us because you sent Jesus Christ to this earth to die on the cross for our sins to be crucified, to be buried, and to be risen from the dead on the third day. So, Father, we thank you for that, and we thank you for church family and friends that we can come alongside one another and pray, especially during these times. I pray that you would be with Bev and their family and Russell and just comfort them, Lord, during this time. And, Lord, as we prepare our hearts now to hear 
what you have to say in your word. Lord, we want to try to explain just a little bit about your great love. And Lord, in order for us to do that, we have to know why it is that you came. So I pray that you would guide us today as we do that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. How many of you have ever driven on the highway and missed an exit? Ladies, you may have to help your husband a little bit, you know, just raise his hand. You know, it's always interesting because guys don't admit when they miss an exit. No, I, I think the next exit, there's less traffic. So that's why I postponed turning right, they might say. Or, you know, I think the tacos are cheaper in the next exit. So that's why I prefer. But if we are looking at 595 here, we're coming from Fort Lauderdale Airport. And all of a sudden we realize, you know, we, had, we need to head down to Miami. We need to go south, right? For some of us who always use our phones, that means you have to go left. We have to go south. But let's say for whatever reason, we decide, you know, I just feel adventurous today. You know, I'm not Crocodile Dundee, but I want to see the Everglades. And although I have to be in Miami, I'm going to just spend a little bit more time on that center lane. And that center lane is going to take us where? It's going to take us right through to Naples. Now, I love Naples. The sand is very crisp. You know, it's beautiful. But if I have an appointment in Miami, I need to get off and go south. Every second, every minute I spend on Naples north takes me further and further away from where I need to be. You know, when Jesus came to this earth... He came during a time that evil was rampant. I know for some of us that's hard to believe because we think, you know, things are terrible today. And and in reality, in many ways they are. But back then when Jesus was born, no one was really looking for God in the sense of there wasn't this global movement of people looking for God. The world was going in a in a certain direction. People were, were comfortable. People were very religious. They had a lot of things they would follow. But the Bible tells us their heart was really, really far from God. They knew all the motions. They knew all the right words. They knew all the prayers. But their heart was far from God. And what we want to do today, which is somewhat atypical, I will admit, is take a look at the idea of why Jesus came and the importance of understanding how our sin really comes into play with why Jesus came. The Bible describes sin as anything that I do that I know or don't know that goes against what God says not to do or something that I choose not to do that God says you should do. When we sin, the Bible tells us we are separated more and more from God. As a matter of fact, we were born in sin. We were born with a sin nature. And because of that sin nature, you and I were experts at a very young age, many of us, on how to say all the curse words that we could in our language. We, didn't, we learned that with tremendous ease because it was in our nature. And when we were with the kids in the playground, just like I was, we perfected a very important word called mine. And that was the word that was just at the center of our thought because everything we thought revolved around us. But when Jesus came, you have to know this, sin was very great like it is today. People were doing things that broke the heart of God just like today. So then the question is, well, If sin was so great, why did Jesus have to come? So here's how we're going to start today. It's here in your notes. It says, when sin is great, love must be greater. When sin is great, love must be greater. When sin was great on this earth, the love of God compelled him to come to this earth and give his life for you and for me. And here's what I have come to discover now as a pastor for over 10 years. 
if you don't really understand the magnitude of your sin, you will never understand the magnitude of God's love. You will not understand how much God loves you until you realize how much sin you have and how much that sin has affected a holy and righteous and perfect God. But here's the good news. Once you understand how deep and how wide and how terrible your sin really is, all you can do is be grateful and humble by what God has done for you on the cross. So the most grateful people in the world, you know who they are? The ones who recognize that they are, if not by God's grace, the worst sinners on the planet. The more I know about my sin, the more I appreciate God's love. So let's take a look at Matthew 1. It's here in your notes. If you have your Bible, you can follow along with us. Here we have it out of the English Standard Version. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed or engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So what do we find as we look at Matthew 1? Well, we find here the announcement of the Savior. This is the announcement of the greatest story ever told. This is the announcement of no one less than Jesus Christ himself. So for us to understand this a little bit better, we have to understand the royal lineage. Now, how many of you have signed up for Ancestry.com? Let me see your hand. Some of you have. Okay, you found out some interesting things about your past, about your background, where you're from. You know, that, that is a very popular thing nowadays. Well, back in these times when Jesus was born, it was very important for you to know and for people to know where you were from and what family you were from. So it says here in your notes, the royal lineage. This is the royal lineage of the Messiah. The Savior would come through Joseph's family. So when Joseph, who was engaged to Mary, he was, you know, he would go back and look on his history. He would be able to trace his lineage all the way back to King David, even to Abraham. So he had the royal line. So Jesus was born to Mary and to Joseph, although Joseph had no sexual relations with Mary until after Jesus was born. He was the adopted father of the Savior. Now, look at the next point. It was also involving a divine intervention. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So this was a miraculous work of God. It was initiated by God, and it was sustained by God. Listen, there are, there are some things that only God can do, and this is one of them. The virgin birth is something that, although there have been many different, you know, views on this, this is something that we know happened. Why? Because God is the one who initiated this. Mary was simply the vessel. She was simply the willing vessel that said, Lord, whatever you want to do, I am here. But God is the one. It was his seed that birthed Christ. It was not the seed of a man. So we have the royal lineage we have the divine intervention, and now we have the gender. It says, she will bear a son. So the Savior was to be born a male. He was a male, and that's what the angel told them. But then, notice this interesting part, the name. You shall call his name Jesus. So it says, Jesus equals Jehovah is salvation. So when people would see Jesus later on when he was a man, they would look at him and say, you know, God is with us. God's salvation is here. He is the Messiah. He is the Redeemer. He is the one who came to save us 
from our sin. And then the angel told him about his mission. He will save his people from their sins. So the angel told them the lineage. He told them the mission. He told them the gender. He told them the name. And now they were ready. Everything was done. And now the baby was going to be born. And the purpose was very, very simple. He would save his people from their sin. Have you ever been in a situation where something is beyond your control? Have you ever been in the ocean and you weren't paying attention and a wave knocks you over and you start, you know, tumbling and you don't know which way is up, which way is down? There are some things that are beyond our control and they require the assistance of somebody else. It doesn't take us long to look back this year and the year before to look at California and the massive wildfires they had. A friend of mine, I called just to see if he was okay, and he said, you know, Marcel, uh, a neighbor knocked at our door just in time. We got out literally with the shirts on our back, and our house completely burned down. He lived near Napa Valley. Other people, they were driving on the expressway, and the the fire was so strong, the fire actually leaped from the mountain to the car, consumed the car. But here was the most interesting thing, at least for me. They said at certain points, the fire in California was traveling 150 feet per second. Now, I want you to think for a minute. If the fire is traveling 150 feet per second, how long will it take us, will it take the fire to consume this entire building? One second. So it didn't matter how many guys and, and gals they had out there trying to put out the fire. It didn't matter how many, you know, I mean, just gallons and gallons of fire retardant and all this. It didn't matter. It was too much. It was overwhelming. The people had to leave as fast as as they possibly could. When Jesus came to this earth, sin was growing, sin was spreading, and things were bad, and it wasn't going to be stopped until the Savior of the world, the King of Kings, came down and died on the tree that he created for our sins. It's one thing when I make a mess and I clean it up. It's one thing when I make a mess and somebody graciously comes and helps me clean it up. But when I make a mess that I cannot pick up, I have to rely on someone else. When the world made a mess of their sin, God came and said, I got this. I'm going to clean up this mess I'm going to do what needs to be done because, you know, even today, over 2,000 years later, you and I can look back a day, a week, a month and see a broken family, a destroyed relationship, somebody that was hurt, somebody possibly that was killed, all because somebody chose to do things their own way. But remember what we said early on. When sin is great... Love must be greater. So what is the Christmas story about? The Christmas story is about a king who lived in heaven, who lived from eternity past, and he was constantly surrounded by everything that is beautiful and pure and holy. And he made his creation, and he let them live, and he gave them what we all have, which is a, a free will. But then when things got so bad and in a time that was appointed, the king himself stepped off of his throne. He came down in the form of a man. He lived among people. He came to be crucified, and then he died. And he rose again from the grave so that we can have a solution to a mess that we could not get out of. So it says the eternal king rules in heaven. This is what we see in the scripture. 
God rules supremely. Whoever stands up to God eventually will not stand up to God. The Bible says, and I love this, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The people who mock him today, publicly or privately, guess what? One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So let's learn a little bit about this eternal king. Number one, Jesus is eternal God and Savior. He is eternal God and Savior. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him, talking about Christ, talking about the king, in him was life, and this life was the light of men. But we all know the end of the story. But people didn't want that light, but he came anyways. It says, Jesus is the Lord of lords and the king of kings who rules supremely. One day, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come back for us. He's going to take us to heaven. We're going to have a great feast. You know, I'm just, I can't wait. It's going to be great. You know, ropa vieja, you know, steak, all this good stuff. But, you know, we're going to have a great time. And then Jesus is going to come back again to judge the nations. And you know what? He's going to judge the nations by the word of his mouth. His very words will speak death to people who have rejected him so now we look at jesus created all things he sustains all things and he holds all things together everything that you see is held together by christ hebrews 1 3 you have it here in your notes talking about jesus it says he is the radiance of the glory of god the exact imprint of his nature. I'd like you to underline this, this phrase, please. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Listen. The king of kings, the lord of lords, holds everything together, including the entire universe, by a spoken word. Some of us come home and we walk through the door and we say, serve me, O family. And the family says, we don't have that power. But through his spoken word, he holds everything together. You know, I I studied organic chemistry for a couple of years and it's just cool. The electrons, the atoms, the neutrons, everything he holds together by a single word. If he holds everything together by a single word, he is more than capable to forgive all of your sin by a single death on the cross. The same God who holds everything together is the same God who gave his life for us. That is amazing. That is amazing. God took care of your biggest problem, my biggest problem, himself, when he went to the cross. And then it says, Jesus lives and reigns forever in a holy kingdom that lasts forever. So the king, he rules supremely forever. He came to this earth, but notice the next point. Although we are the king's creation, we submit to another king we submit to another king it says here we submit to the king of personal independence from god and the bible calls that king sin i mean many of us who are now in our 30s our 40s beyond we can look back when we were younger and say yeah i was a real knucklehead I mean, I was just, I had an issue with authority. I had an issue with this teacher or with this person or this family member. You know, I just wanted to do things my way. Listen, that's part of life. 
understanding that, number one, your way is not the best way, but number two, God has a way that's the best way. God has a plan that's the best plan. God has a purpose that is the best purpose. In Genesis 3, we all know the story, right? Adam and Eve are in the garden. They are walking around, and God said, hey, you can have from any of these trees here, no problem. There's one tree I don't want you to eat from. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, they had perfect trees. They weren't spraying for pesticides. It was just great. They were all organic. But God said, this one tree you cannot eat. And they started having a conversation with a snake. Anyone see a problem when you have a conversation with a snake? And the snake said, did God really say that you're going to die? You're not going to die. What did he do? He placed doubt in the mind of the woman, which eventually transferred to the mind and the will of the man. So she looked at the tree, and she thought to herself, man, that's a beautiful tree. It was pleasant to her eyes. She said, you know, if I can just eat of this fruit, you know, I will be so wise. And the Bible says when she took of the fruit, and she gave some to her husband, and he took of the fruit, he did it willingly, she was deceived. But they were both wrong before God then the Bible says from that moment forward, they died. They were dead. They were still walking around, but spiritually they were, they were dead. And then they started to have a reduced lifespan because of the choice that they made to disobey God. So what do we do today? We do something very similar. We submit to our feelings and desires over God's word. We say, you know, I know what the Bible says, B-U-T, but I feel this way. Whenever you get to the point in your life where what you feel takes precedence over what God says, you're going down a slippery slope. Whenever what you feel is a bigger priority than doing what you know is right, you're getting ready to experience great pain. Notice the second one. What we want to see, just like the woman, just like the man, and what we want to touch, we submit to that. I can't tell you how many times I, I talk with guys and they say, Marcel, but I didn't think it was a big deal. I always felt it's okay if you look but not touch, but my looking got me to touching, and my touching got me in big trouble. That's what Adam and Eve wanted. I just want to look at the tree. I just want to touch the tree. What do we submit to? We submit to temporary pleasures over God's provision. I was watching a documentary last night on Lawrence Taylor, by far the best linebacker who's ever played the game of football, in my humble opinion. And he talks about his life, and then he, he shares how at different points in his life, he got off track and he got into, into drugs, and, you know, he, he messed up some really, really key relationships. You know, every time you and I look for something temporary... You know what I find? It bites us for a long time. The things that we often regret are not these gigantic, enormous sins. It's the little things that nobody saw, that no one was aware of, but it doesn't get out of our mind. Those are the things, until we confess them and get right with God, that plague us. We also submit to our pride by placing ourselves on the throne of our lives. And we submit to cultural identities rather than to our identity in Christ. 
Listen, I know the culture tries to say this is who you are. God says this is who you are. What God says about you is much more important than what anyone or any culture thinks that you are. So all these things are things that you and I have submitted to. All these things create problems. It says our submission to the wrong king has created a big mess. Our submission to the wrong king has created a big mess. And this submission is really called sin. That's what it is. It's not pretty. It's not a big word. But it's the reality. There's a a pastor that I listen to at times, and he said something that I thought was just profound. He says, when I choose to sin, I choose to suffer. Pastor James McDonald has a church in Chicago. When I choose to sin, I choose to suffer. And I want you to think about that for a minute. All of us here can look in our families or in our friendships or in our work relationships and we can see how the deception of one person has destroyed great friendships, family relationships, businesses, Whatever, we can see that. All of us can give at least one example. Now, notice what it says here in your notes. When we submit to sin, we make excuses. When you and I choose to sin, we choose to suffer. But when we choose to sin, when we choose to submit to sin, you know what happens? We make excuses why we do things. Instead of saying, you know what, I said that, that was wrong, please forgive me, I'm sorry. We say, well, you have to understand that I'm trying to contextualize my verbal, no, it's just wrong. And we get fancy and we get cute, but when it's all said and done, it hurts other people. Here's one, when we submit to sin, we submit to suffering. There have been people who have actually gotten sick, really sick. And it wasn't until they made things right with God and those around them that they were healed of their sickness. Isn't that a scary thought? You know, is is the reason why I'm not getting better because I am hiding sin and I'm not... I'm just playing along this game. And there have been people who have actually gotten better by being honest with God and with others. What does sin produce? Well, sin produces great pain, great sorrow, and great destruction. We see it every day, right? We see it all around us. We may see an extreme example in in a terrorist attack, But we see other examples that are not as extreme, but they are equally as damaging to people we know. So we continue to hurt others. We continue to hurt ourselves. We continue to make things worse by remaining in our sin. And this is what happened when Jesus came. Hey, uh, we're going to go to temple today. We know exactly what to say. We know the prayers we need to pray. We know how much we need to put in the offering plate. We got this. No problem. Their hearts, the Bible says, were far from God. But there's one problem that we have that we are unable to solve. And this is the problem of why Jesus came. Jesus left everything in heaven. He left all of his glory all of the royalty, all of the worship, because there was a problem that his creation could not solve. It was a big mess. It says here, it was growing more and more out of control. And what was the final product of this mess? The final product was simply spiritual death, physical death. That's what happens. Every time I go to a funeral, I'm reminded 
although I don't always say it, that death is the final product of sin. When you go to a funeral and you see someone laying in a casket, what you have to understand is that when it's all said and done, that is the promise of deception. That your life will continue. We all have a starting point and we have an ending point. Because we die points back to the sin in our lives. We can't fix our spiritual problem. We can only hope that God will help us. So what's the good news? The king's love for his creation compelled him to clean up our mess. The king's love for his creation compelled him to clean up our mess. I love this verse in Galatians 4. Paul writes, notice, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Notice this word, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is an amazing verse because this talks about a spiritual reality when somebody comes to Christ. It, it essentially tells us that before we come to Christ, all of us are enslaved to sin. Sin is our master. Sin is what controls us. We might not be as bad in our minds as other sinners, but we are still captivated, captured, and controlled by someone other than God. But then when Christ comes into our life, he redeems us, he makes us his sons, he makes us his daughters, and not only does he redeem us, he rescues us, but he gives us an inheritance. He gives us something that we not only benefit from today, but also for all of eternity. Let me ask you a question. If somebody came up to you after church and says, I have an inheritance I would like to give it to you. What would you say? Thank you, Jesus. Just bring it on, brother. May the Lord bless and multiply you right, right here. Just give it to me. All right? You know, if we don't deserve, or we don't have an inheritance, and someone says, I'm going to give you all of these blessings just because I, I want to, not because you deserve it, but because I want to, that is a great thing. When we look here at the word redeem, it's to buy back. In other words, God created us. We got lost in sin. And then God himself came to buy us back from the penalty of our sin, which we couldn't fix. It's like we created the problem. He is the solution. He came and fixed all of this himself. Why would God do that? Why would Jesus leave heaven, come to earth, and pay the cost of our mess with his life? It's one word. What is it? It's love. Why would God come in the form of a man to clean up the mess we created? One word, love. Why is it sometimes that people in your life do some horrific things and you forgive them, and you show them grace, it's one word. It's love. Listen, sometimes you're not going to be able to have someone that you know react in the same way that you're going to react. You just have to love them. You know, sometimes we have this idea that, well, when I get married, I will be able to change that person. You're not going to be able to change that person. God is going to be the one to change that person. You've got to love that person and let God do the changing. So as we unwrap the gift of love, the eternal king left his glorious throne to clean up the mess of our sin. 
wives are home and it's a Saturday afternoon you don't have to work so you decide you're going to treat yourself to a beauty treatment so you go in the bathroom and you know you wash your hair you know you put conditioner you blow dry your hair you paint your nails you do all this stuff and then your husband comes in and says babe I need you to help me move this tree outside most of you would say I cannot say anything because I may sin against you so please depart from me <laughs> most of us would not go out and say honey I love you I want to get dirty with you let's go move that big palm tree just not happening but I want you to think about what Jesus left he left the perfection of heaven where he ruled supremely where sin was not present to come down and get dirty because you and I were filthy I want you to know that we will never fully understand God's love until we see him face to face we will never understand just how much he gave up until we see him and experience him for ourselves. It says, although the mess of our sin was great, God's love for us is greater. Imagine going home and you left for some reason a five-gallon tank of gasoline in the living room. And you have to go to the restroom a minute and you walk out and your son or your daughter they were little they, they just kind of tipped it over so they see the gas is kind of pouring out and they think man this is better than slip and slide you know this is great there's gas everywhere you know what do you do when you walk out and you see them you know you just bought those Giorgio Armani shoes you just got those pair of pants from Macy's on sale, 75% off, no coupon. <laughs> Does any of that matter? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have to throw your shoes away. It doesn't matter if you've got to bathe 20 times to get the smell of gas off of you. The only thing that matters is the safety of that child. The only thing that you're concerned about is that they have created a mess that they are ignorant of. They think this is fun. They think this is a cool smell. They might even think it's perfume. But this can cost them their life. So I jump in and I help them out. Some people think they're on cruise control. They think, man... Things are so well. My job is well. My family is well. Money's in the bank. What they don't realize is spiritually, it's a different world. You and I don't know what tomorrow brings. You may be on spiritual ICU and not even aware that you're on the table. But what I want you to know today is that the eternal king who had all the glory in heaven, who by his very word can command and angels would go. That he holds all the atoms and all the electrons and all the neutrons and all the other tons that you and I have no idea what they are. He holds everything by the word of his power. And he gave everything so that he can clean your mess and give you the right to be called his son, his daughter. And not only that, but he gives you an inheritance to say, this is yours. It's like, it's great that you're my son, it's great that you're my daughter, but I want you to know I'm giving you more. That's the king that we serve. When sin is great, love must be greater. I want to draw your attention to verse 21 again of Matthew 1 she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins so then the question has to ask okay if God did all this 
if he left his throne in heaven, what does he want? He took the initiative. He took the first step. He gave his life. He died. What does he want from me? Would somebody just tell me? It's two words. The king commands us to repent. That means to turn from our sin and believe in the message of Jesus. Imagine a friend picks you up. You're going to Art Basel in Miami Beach. You're ready to go. And he decides to get on the exit ramp going on to 95. And you see this sign that says, wrong way. It's funny how they don't need to put that in Spanish or in Creole. Everybody knows. Not the right way. So you see this sign that says, wrong way. And all of a sudden, your heart starts racing. And you look at your friend who you love, and you say, dude, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Every second that goes by, every minute that goes by, increases my chance of getting into an accident and increases my chance of meeting Jesus before I really want to. And you tell them, stop. Turn around. And they look at you, I'm like, I'm offended. You spoke to me so harshly. I thought we were friends. Do you care that they're offended? No. The message that God gives us is a very clear message. God loves us. We are sinners. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. Without Christ, you are dead spiritually, separated from God eternally. With Christ, you are a son or a daughter. You have an inheritance and you have eternal life starting right now. Some of you today might be going the wrong way. And if you're going the wrong way, God allows U-turns. He's not going to force you. You say, well, I was baptized when I was a little kid. I did confirmation. That's fine. That's what your parents wanted. But this is you. What are you going to do when you understand that for months, years, you've been going the wrong way. And the only solution to making the right turn is a person who's a king, who came as a savior, and he died for your sins. Ephesians 1.7, here it's in your notes. It says, in him, it's talking about Christ. Notice, we have redemption through his what? Blood. Why are we talking about blood during Christmas? Because the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. God is infinitely rich. And in his richness, he offers you blood. If you don't know Christ, what I hope you get this Christmas is blood. I hope you get the blood of the Savior all over you. I hope you realize that there's nothing that you can do apart from Christ to get right with God. Buddha is dead, Muhammad is dead, and all these other Kishnas are dead. Only Jesus Christ is alive. And he says, this Christmas, what I give to you is my blood. And everyone who rejects the gift of his blood is rejected by God. I've been rejected from a lot of things by a lot of people. I don't want to be rejected by God. But Jesus says, everyone who comes to me, I will by no means cast what do you want this Christmas? Do you want God's love? Do you want His blood?
It's very simple. When sin is great, love must be greater. What Jesus Christ did for you is much bigger than Christmas. This gift is immeasurable. This gift is just awesome. What are you going to do with the gift that God offers? Would you bow your heads? As you think about what we've spoken about this morning, maybe you say, Marcel, I'm, I'm already a Christian. I, I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I know that Jesus shed his blood for me. I, I know that I'm saved. That, that's great. You've got a little over two weeks to make a big impact before Christmas Day. What are you going to do for your boss this Christmas to help them know the Savior? What are you going to do for the people that live around you so that they might know the love of the Savior? What can you do for the people you work with, the people you study with, so that they might know the love of the Savior? Maybe it's a card. Maybe it's an invite to church. Maybe it's just telling your story of faith in a way that is just genuine. But do something. Because this love is great. And the people you know need Christ. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, I'm so glad you're here. We are so glad that you're here. One of the greatest joys that we could have today is knowing that you received Christ today. That you believe in Christ and you accept him as your Savior and you turn from your sins and you, you make a U-turn and you decide today to follow Jesus. As we just sit in silence for just a moment, is there anyone here today that you would say, you know, Marcel, I, I've been in church before but I've never really made the message of Jesus Christ personal to me. I know that other people have, but, but I haven't. But today I realize that God is offering me a gift, and I have two choices. I either accept it or I reject it. And today I choose to accept what Christ has done for me. In the silence of this time, without music, without noise. If you want to know Christ as King and Savior and Lord, right there where you are in a prayer, just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you came and you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were buried and you rose again from the grave Lord, I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I know that I am a sinner. And I'm deeply sorry for my sin. Lord, today I ask that you please forgive me for all my sin. I invite you into my heart. I ask you to help me to grow. Thank you for making me your child. Thank you for your great love. Father, we come to you today and we come with grateful hearts. Lord, the only reason that love is so great is our sin. The only reason that we deeply appreciate what you have done is recognizing that your love transcends all things. Lord, the more we know about the reality of our sin, the better we understand your infinite love. 
And Father, today I pray that we would walk out of here encouraged, knowing that this love is not only for us, it's for everyone who we know, it's for everyone who we speak with, it's for the whole world. Thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you pray.